Father in heaven, we're grateful that we can be here in the house this day, in this morning, in this day. Lord, we're, we're thankful that we have the, the blessing of being able to come together in fellowship, that we have the privilege of being able to come before thy word and to be taught of it. Thankful, Lord, that we live in a nation that affords us that privilege and that right, and that, Lord, we pray that we wouldn't take it for granted. Lord, we know that even as we gather in this day, there are many that are sick. We gather here in circumstances that are maybe frustrating um, with some of the things that continue to go wrong. But Lord, we know that you have a plan that is particular for each of our needs and a message that's needful for each of our hearts. And so as we would look into your word today, we'll look forward to those blessings and that teaching and give thee thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. This is going to seem too coincidental, but um, last Wednesday or last Sunday afternoon, I shared a little bit, and as I was thinking at the table about the topic to share, uh, I asked the kids. I said, um, "You know what? There's these two thoughts that are in my mind, and one was what we shared last week, and the other one was um, God changing your plans or discouragement." And they didn't think that God changing plans or discouragement was all that exciting. So they said, well, do the other one. And, and I, I, was, I felt the conviction to do that too. So we, but this other thought of God changing your plans or of plans being changed and then discouragement that goes along with some of those things. Um, before Tim called me last night and frantically asked where to turn the, how to turn the water off, and before my two oldest kids walked into our bedroom in the middle of the night to tell us that they had um, caught the bug that Max had earlier in the week, um, this thought of discouragement was already on my mind. Like this, this, this was not a product of water on the floor and of the IT issues and all that kind of stuff. But an experience I made two, I think it was two weeks ago, um, We will read out of Acts chapter 8, and and my plan for this morning is to actually read read the passage and kind of um, meditate on it as we read it. But I wanted to give you the the story that came, or that kind of led to this thought. I've always admired in Scripture the story of Philip the Evangelist. The story of Philip, this man that was a, was chosen at the beginning of chapter 8, he was one of the ones that was chosen with Stephen to minister to the temporal needs of the congregation. And as we're going to read, this, this is a man that is, is raised up to effectively be a trustee. I guess let's use that word. Or a deacon. He's raised up to have that responsibility. And somehow, because of the persecution of Stephen, the church is, 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 is scattered. The folks scatter because of the persecution and the fear that goes along with that. And he finds himself in Samaria and has this amazing experience in Samaria. And then we learn in that same story, Philip is led by the Spirit out to Ethiopia. And I've always had this thought and this, this question as to why, why he didn't get to stay and to experience, dare I say, the fruits of his labors the fruits of the Lord's labors or the Spirit's labors in his life and see this, this church that was developed there. And I was thinking about this story as I, uh, on a Wednesday evening a couple of weeks ago. And what had happened was on Monday morning of that week, I, I got in my truck or my or Ashley's car, it doesn't matter, but I got in my car at 4.45 and started driving down to Goshen, New York. Now, that was the Monday that we had the big snowstorm, Sunday night into Monday. And I drove down there, should have been a three-ish hour drive, ends up being like four and a half hours, semis flipped over, the road's not, it just was a bad, bad trip. And I was going to view a project that we're, our, I'm involved with, that I'm kind of taking the lead on, that is by far the biggest thing I've ever been involved with. We're building, or will be building, a factory for... Um, well, for I won't use the name. Yeah, fine, I can. We're not even recorded today. Not that it matters. 
Uh, Amy's Kitchen. I never knew what this was. Uh, my wife tells me that she's been having soup from this company for a long time, but it's a vegetarian, all organic, like very, very um, health conscious company. And they're building a plant in Goshen, right next to Legoland, for what it's worth, um, to make soup. Plant is 150,000 square feet. To this day, the biggest thing I've ever built new construction is like 12,000. 150,000 square feet. It's huge. The property um, is a 300 acre plot, and we have 75 acres of that plot. I mean, this is so big of a build, such a big building that we're bringing direct power to be our own power plant. We're bringing in, we're, we're making our own wastewater treatment plant. Like, this is huge. And what's supposed to be there, what I've, and mind you, you know I've been here for six, now I guess, yeah, six weeks is my involvement with the company. This was handed off to me and they've told me that, you know what, you're going to go down there, you're going to meet with these folks. There is a, a building that they built to just get the ground broken. It's an office building. It's about 5,000 square feet. You'll see it and we're going to be adding this 150,000 to that. I'll make this quicker than them. It sounds like it will be. I get in the, I'm driving down, I get down south, I pull up to the plot, and I crest this hill, and as I crest this hill, I look down in front to this probably 200 acre portion of the property that's all prepped for construction, and there is a 220,000 square foot pavilion already under construction on the property. 220,000. So just for rough numbers, this is a building that's it this is a a building that's supposed to hold 22,000 people. So that new big expo center they just built at the at the fairgrounds, take that double it and this thing is being built already on the property. And I am very confused. Cuz this is not what I'm supposed to be built. Like this is my site and there's stuff there that's not supposed to be there. Turns out that this site is also the site of a retreat center that's being built for a group called Science of the Soul, of which the owners of this company are major donors, apparently, as evidenced by this giant pavilion. And they will have gatherings of 22,000 people twice a year to come to this place and talk about Science of the Soul. This sermon has nothing to do with science of the soul. Just the magnitude of the building and the project and all that stuff. I'm just trying to convey it. I eventually find the guy I'm supposed to meet with. I go through a series of meetings. I meet with a bunch of folks from the village and the town and the state uh, relative to approvals for our project. And I'm getting very excited because this is huge. And I've never gotten to do something like this. And we are ready to break ground like really soon. I get home. I'm telling the kids and Ashley about how exciting this is. I told them on my way home, I actually drove through the parking lot at Legoland because I, well, of course I drove through the parking lot at Legoland. That night, I'm looking at how much it costs to stay at the Legoland Hotel because I'm going to have to go down there quite often and figured it would be fun for the kids and Ashley to come. And this is all supposed to happen like early April to uh, late April is when we're supposed to break ground because everything is ready to go. Get back to my office Tuesday morning, and I have an invitation for a, a, a Microsoft meeting, a Teams meeting with the folks from California. And the meeting um, just adds more urgency. I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that. The, they're pressing us, when can we get started? When can we get started? We've got to break ground. When will all of the documents be done? I get to tell them, you know, I, I'm excited. We had a great meeting yesterday. The town's ready to approve us. We're ready to go. Site contractor's ready to keep working. About 5 o'clock that night, I get another team's invitation from the same guy, but this time with like 12 other people from Amy's kitchen. And they are all financial people. I'm noticing it's all the financial department. And it is to replace... A meeting the next day that we normally have as a project meeting and 10 uh, 11 o'clock comes around we all jump on to our call and my boss is not on the call yet and so they they start asking me well are, Mike are you in a position to talk about you know some modifications to the plan and I said no I'm 
Let me go get, let me go get my boss because I'm not in a position to make modifications. And they tell us that due to, um, due to conditions in the industry, mind you, this building, this project with Amy's has been five years in planning. Five years that they've been trying to get going here. Due to changes in the industry, changes in the market, they've had to push pause on the project. And they are going from a soup line to a pasta line. Which, that sounds, your face is exactly what my face was. Like, okay, big deal. Like, I don't really care what you're building in the building. I'm just building the building. Like, no big deal. Well, apparently to change from pasta, to, from soup to pasta, is a monumental change. Complete redesign possibly selling the site, possibly moving to another area of the site, possibly not doing the project altogether. Pause, 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 pause. And it's a, it's a Microsoft Teams meeting, so you can see everybody's faces. Um, because our, our protocol at work is we don't ever leave our, we're never blank screen. We always have to have our faces shown. And my boss takes his, his just sitting there. I mean, if this is big for me, it's probably pretty big for him. And the change and the disappointment and the frustration that went into this. And I, as I got home that night, I just had to laugh and think of how excited I got and how, how, how awesome this was and how frustrated I am now. Does it mean that the project's dead? Does it mean that we're not going to do it? No, we still, they, they want to build, they want to make pasta instead of soup. Probably means that we'll do construction next winter, which probably means I don't get to go to Legoland, or my kids don't get to Lego, go to Legoland. I probably wasn't going anyways. But the plans were all changed. And what, what I was left to wonder is, why, how, how should we react? How should my reaction be to shifts and changes and, and adjustments that are, are brought into my path? That was way too long of an introduction, but I wanted to give you the background as to where, where this thought came from. I guess I'm going to probably skip uh, around and, and, and maybe read, summarize certain areas of this passage. But as I said, we, we start chapter 8 with the words, Saul was consenting unto his death. This is um, confirming Stephen's murder. And that the disciples, or excuse me, that the, the early church at that point was scattered and folks went, went about their way um, because of the persecution. Starting in verse 4, it says, Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voices, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and were lame, and were healed. And there was great joy in the city. I'll just pause. Philip goes from what is probably one of the most discouraging, painful, fearful experiences in his life with his brother Stephen being killed, to going into a city where he wasn't to, he wasn't even supposed to be there in the first place. Samaria, Samaria was not a place where the Jews um, interacted. We, we know this. The, the story of the Good Samaritan, um, from any, any exposure to the word that we have, we know that that wasn't a place they're supposed to go. And yet, here he's having these monumental experiences. People, people that are possessed are, are crying out with loud voices and coming out of these folks that were, were possessed. Folks that are lame and, and broken are healed. Continuing verse 9, But there was a certain man named Simon, who was before time in the, city used of sor- in the same city used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him... They had regard, because that a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. And when they believed Philip's preaching, the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered 
beholding the miracles and signs which were done. In addition to having this great success, this great spiritual success of healing people and um, casting out demons and baptizing people, we have this man that was the controller in the city. Not controller. He controlled the city. Because of the spell or the, the, the influence that he had on them because of his sorceries and his witchcraft and all of these evil doings that he had, this, this hold that he had on the people was so great that they, he even proclaimed him to be, uh, how does it say, the great power of God. This guy, even this guy, is so moved by Philip's teaching and so moved by the transformation that he sees of the people around him that even this guy comes and is baptized and follows Philip. It's just, it leaves you speechless almost. In verse 14, when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Now in the past, this was one of the parts of the story that was a little discouraging to me. Because I always wondered, why did Peter and John have to come? Why wasn't Philip good enough to handle things in Samaria? It almost feels like Philip has all this success and then John and and Peter have to kind of parachute in to make sure that it's all good. Make sure, you know, kind of check in on things. And I always got, I felt like he got kind of a, a short, he almost got the short end of the stick where he wasn't, he didn't get to see this all to fruition. Well, Part of the, I have a little bit different view of that today. It says, when Peter and John came, when they came down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they that were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. So we hear that statement. We read that statement and we think to ourselves, I think to myself, so what, what, what's the story here? Wait a second. This is a, dis- this is a follower. This is somebody that was baptized. This is someone that believed. Verse 13, Simon himself believed also and was baptized, and he continued with Philip, wondered, and beholding the miracles and signs that were done. And yet, now he's making this, he's, he's asking this question. We know the story well enough. We know what Peter's going to respond. But there is this, this question about Simon's position. Let's, let's leave it at that. Verse 20, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Rather than focusing in on Simon and Peter, Simon the Sorcerer, and Peter's conversation. What struck me as I was looking into this uh, recently was Philip again. So I said I used to be, I used to find it unfair that Philip would have this, you know, have to have somebody helicopter in. But set that aside. What do you think it was like for Philip to have to watch this encounter unfold in front of him? Here's this man that... You know, maybe Philip, it, it doesn't say that he was a, a it doesn't say that, that Simon was a disciple. It doesn't say that Simon, it doesn't make any proclamation other than to say that Simon believed. But believed enough and Philip baptized him. Philip, we don't read any reason that Philip would have, would have had a question about Simon's faith before this experience. And then we read this experience where Peter comes right out and says, I perceive that thou art in the bond, or excuse me, in the gall of bitterness, and in the bond of iniquity. If I'm Philip, I'm pretty discouraged in that moment. I'm probably a little shocked. I'm probably wondering, 
because maybe this, well, this probably says something more about me than it does Philip. But I'm wondering, where was my discernment? Did I miss something? Was there something in this man, Simon the Sorcerer, that I should have caught sooner? Is there something that I didn't catch that I, you know, he, um, maybe I should have been more cautionary with this, or more cautious with this. He was, he was this one that was doing all kinds of sorcery, and I, I thought that, you know, I, I cast out all of these other um, unclean spirits and healed all these folks, and it just made perfect sense that he would be moved by that miracle and that he would be, he would be brought to faith. And now Peter's saying, well, th- this is, you know, clearly what he said is not right. What he, what he said revealed his heart. But why didn't I see that? Verse 24 says, Then Simon answered, then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Even the request that Simon makes, he doesn't, he doesn't ask God to have mercy on him. He doesn't, in that moment, um, share a repented heart other than to say, Simon, take care of this for me. You pray to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken, come upon me. If you translate it, it, it almost it translates more to a, oh, please, please make sure that doesn't happen. Hopefully that won't happen. It's, it's not a commitment of his own reserv- or resignation to the will of God, to his repentance um, to the Father, to his submission to the Father, but of a hopeful prayer that this wouldn't come to pass. And again, to Philip, as he's thinking about that and watching this unfold and wondering, boy, did I... I wonder, I wonder why I didn't see this. That would be my response. That, that would be my, my take, to, to kind of wallow in the discouragement there for a minute and, and wonderment as, as to what has just unfolded. And maybe, maybe there was some measure of that, but I don't think there was too much because in verse 26, immediately thereafter, and we had a kind of a quick conversation this morning about how chronologically we can how close chronologically we can take some of these things but for the purposes of this morning the next thing we read about philip is and the angel of the lord spake unto philip saying arise and go toward the south and go into the way that goeth down from jerusalem into gaza which is desert and he arose and went and behold well let me stop there for a second in the midst of the success that he had found And the discouragement that he had just seen, the Spirit of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, says to him, go from where you are out into the desert. You're already in a secluded place. You're already in a place that you wouldn't otherwise have been for for comfort's sake. Now I want you to go and be more secluded. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace the queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasures and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, and he read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. In my, in my mind, and I remember the felt board in the Sunday school that showed it this way too, where there was a single man in a chariot with one horse, very fancy chariot, very fancy looking I, I do remember he was a very dark-skinned man. Um, and I remember watching as we would move Philip across the board as he's looking at the, the single chariot. I, I think we had that wrong. I like the felt board, but I don't think it showed. This man was in charge of all the treasures of the Queen of Ethiopia. And at the time, that's not just the small nation we see now. At the time, that was a mass area of most of what would be west, northwest Egypt, or northwest Africa. A massive, massive amount of land. This, this was no small guy. The chariot, this, I don't imagine that this was a single chariot that he was in. I don't imagine that he would not have security around him, that there wouldn't be other people there. I don't imagine that he would have been driving the chariot himself. I'm guessing there was a lot more pomp and circumstance 
to this Ethiopian eunuch as he sits there now, having already gone up to Jerusalem, is on his way back, and he's sitting and reading Isaiah. And from some distance, I'm guessing, Philip sees him, and the Spirit says, okay, go, go, talk, go talk to that man. Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And we know that Philip wasn't discouraged. We know that he wasn't at least fearful to the point of paralysis because it says, And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Think of the most impressive person you know. Think of... I'm not going to use that example. I'm not, I'm not quickly tongue-tied. I'm not usually one that doesn't have something to say. But I bumped into a famous person once in a spot where you wouldn't expect to see a famous person. And I, I, I could not get the words out. You're going to laugh. It was a Panera bathroom. I bumped into a very famous person in a Panera bathroom and could not say anything then. Uh, eh. I just opened the door and... uh, uh, uh. Yes, some of you know who this person was. I'm not revealing who it was. Philip is supposed to run up to this man. He's supposed to go up to this man. It says, join him to the chariot. He runs up. That shows enough confidence. Then he hears him reading Isaiah and has the confidence in the Spirit to say, do you understand what you're reading? His mind was so focused on revealing Christ... His mind and heart was so focused on sharing the gospel that he heard somebody reading Jewish scripture. Would have had no other reason to, he he could have said, oh, is that your favorite verse? Do you like that one? Oh, have you read the one about the whatever and picked another verse in Isaiah? But no, he jumps right into, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch says, how could I, or how can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb from his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. And in humiliation his judgment was taken away, and, his, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? Clearly, Philip had insight to know that this was a man that was seeking. And we get the evidence of that by the the way that the eunuch responds to these verses that he's read. And Philip opened his mouth and began at that same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Philip didn't whip out a tract. He didn't flip to the the study guide um, cheat sheet in the back of his Bible. From that scripture, now mind you, I'll, I'll, I'll concede, it's a good scripture to use to preach Jesus. To preach the Savior from that scripture is a good one. But he was prepared, I would venture to say, that anything that the eunuch was reading that morning, he was going to work its way into the kingdom of God is this. That Jesus, this is Jesus. This is speaking about Jesus. So that at any moment he could preach unto him Jesus. I, I find this interesting too. They didn't just sit on the back of the chariot. It says, as they went on their way, they continued probably towards Ethiopia more, I would guess. There came, they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Another interesting one. We don't read anything about that the scriptures that he was talking about said anything about being baptized. But through Philip's ministry, through Philip's sermonette to him, his singular sermon to this one man, they got to the point of saying, and you need to be baptized. And it was so impactful on the eunuch. This was so life-changing that they just saw water in the desert. They come to a... a, a, What am I trying to say? What's the word? Anyway, water in the desert. There's a word that I'm not... An oasis, thank you. They come to an oasis... And he says, what, what hinders me from being baptized here? What, what is, what's stopping us from doing this here? I would love to hear the tone in this. Someday I, I would love to be able to have that conversation and say, was this a, is it okay if we, we I mean, there's water here. Can we, can we use this water? Or 
Was this a, baptize me. What, what are you waiting for? Why are we not in the water already? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. Uh, this is what I'm, I, I wonder who commanded. Did Philip command or did the eunuch command? I don't know why I have three, but one of them commanded. I get, in, I get the impression that the eunuch makes this statement. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and Philip commands the chariot to stop. And they went both down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Yeah, I'm going to go with that. I think Philip told the, the chariot to stop. The he would make sense there. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. And the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. I wonder, when Philip is making this statement to the eunuch, and he's saying, what, the eunuch says, what hinders me from getting in the water? And he says, you need to believe. If you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. And the eunuch says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I wonder, in Philip's mind, was he hearkening back to, you know, this is an unlikely guy. This is, this is almost as unlikely as Simon. This makes about as much sense as Simon. And Simon believed, and I baptized him, and look what happened there. Or who knows what happened there. But we don't read any of that about Philip. We, we only, we, all we can gather from his demeanor and his actions as we read them here is that there wasn't room for discouragement. There wasn't room to wallow in frustration and annoying incidences bugging him. I mean, these were way bigger than annoying incidences that he had gone through. These were traumatic things that he had to see and to experience. And yet, when the Spirit said, go, he didn't mumble, complain. He got on his feet. I was going to say got on his horse. But he got on his feet and started walking south. And the Spirit said, there's the man. I don't care how intimidating he looks. I don't care how overwhelming this is going to be. Go join yourself. And he ran. The man asked what he needed to do to be saved. He told him. The man said it. He stopped the chariot there. Again, convoy halt. I don't imagine that was a very quick, Tim, uh, I don't imagine that was a quick experience that just stops this whole, I mean, to stop a caravan like that, everybody locks up and, and, and just looks at this crazy Jewish man that somehow hitched himself onto the chariot and now they're walking down into the water and what is going on? But when they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more. His, I'm, I was going to say his usefulness, no. He would have been, certainly been useful to go with the, the eunuch and to continue with him and to teach him and to guide him and lead him. That wasn't his job. It wasn't Philip's job to grow congregations. It wasn't Philip's job to, to mentor people long term. His job was to be the evangelist, to go here, go there. When the Spirit says go, you go. And sometimes when the Spirit plucks you up and drops you down, that's the other question I have, is what did that feel like, Philip? How did that work? And maybe my favorite part of this story is the last verse. It says, but Philip was found. So after he leaves the eunuch and he is translated, Philip was found at Azotus. And passing through, he preached in all the cities, till he came to Caesarea. It wasn't like after he finished this monumental experience that he got translated back to Jerusalem where he could tell everybody what happened. You're not going to believe what happened. He got translated, moved, transferred, moved on to a city of the Philistines. He didn't get moved out to... I don't mean that I'm not casting dispersions. He didn't get moved to Skinny Atlas to stand on the corner and sing like a Christmas caroler at Christmas time. He got moved to the hood. 
He was sent from one side of the hood in Samaria to, okay, Ethiopia probably wasn't, but back to another rough, uninviting, unexciting place you wouldn't want to be. And so what I, the takeaway for me for this was, one, we need to always be ready, as Philip was, always be ready to start our conversations with folks about the Spirit and, and getting them to Jesus as fast as possible. Getting our spiritual conversations to a conversation about Christ as quickly as possible. It's easy to meander around the outside and to talk about those things that are, that are, inoffen- are unoffensive to everybody. I said I wasn't going to talk about the science of the soul thing, but if you dig into it, because I got there and Googled from my parking spot because I was real curious about this big building. It's an everybody loves everybody and everybody can have it their way kind of gospel. It's a taking the best of every religion and mashing it all together for the betterment of humanity. And on a bumper sticker, that looks great. And I'm sure it sounds nice. But getting to the hard context of who Christ is and the hard details of what a redeemed life looks like and of what sin has done to our lives and what God wants that sin nature, where God wants to put that sin nature and the transformation that he wants, that's a little messy. And it's not all that exciting to talk about. But the first thing that Simon, that Simon, sorry, the first thing that Philip looked for when he talked to somebody was, how quickly can I get to Jesus? And maybe the second takeaway, I, there's probably a lot more, is to not be discouraged when God makes little detours. We may not know what's around the next bend. We may not know what what's in store after that next turnoff. We don't have this GPS that we can, you know, click the screen and, and zoom out and see exactly how long it's going to take us to get there. It was supposed to be three hours and eight minutes, and it took me four hours and 30 minutes. And I couldn't figure out why that was when I'm getting in my car at 445. And I got to Binghamton, and I found an, a, a semi-truck sideways on the exit from 81 to 17. That made a lot more sense. You lose a lot of time when something like that's sitting there. But rather than being discouraged about the, the path that the Lord lays out before us, pray that we can be excited to see what he will reveal. And not just excited, but prepared and motivated to be active and ready when the next change comes. Because we don't know if it's an Ethiopian eunuch, we don't know if it's Simon the sorcerer, we don't know if it's to be out in Palestine, or excuse me, in, uh, I said Palestine, Philistines. It was a city of the Philistines. I don't know if it's another Philistine that's supposed to be in my way tomorrow, but I know that the Lord will prepare the path, and if he does, he will allow me to be as prepared as I will allow him to make me. Pray the Lord to bless these words.